welcome back, everybody, to our next talk. Fukami will talk about FOSS and security risk management. And here we go. Test, test, do you hear me? Okay. So yeah, welcome to my presentation. I'm a little bit nervous because it's my first talk in like after five years or something. And also on a subject that uh, was planned very differently because I planned that talk and then I realized while doing that, that my idea didn't play out. That is like uh, when it comes to thinking about risk and, and uh, technology, when you want to do something at scale, it easily turns out that you, uh, yeah, that you, you come up with wrong pictures. Uh, Let's start with who I am. Um, uh, my name is Fukami. I uh, used to be a red teamer most of my life um, and worked in the la uh, last year for the Human Brain Project, a European research project. And uh, in the future, I'm going to work for the OpenSSF. Um, and this is uh, the organization and the tools that I'm going to introduce a little bit here. My subject uh, is going to be EU software regulation that is not just the CRA that is also uh, the AI Act uh, PLD and especially in, in uh, context of the open SSF the uh, it's either so the, the um, European electronic identification uh, regulation the OpenSSF itself is a spin-off of the Linux Foundation. It was founded after the Log4j uh, like an incident where the industry realized, oh. And um, since then, um, they, uh, it grew to 120 organizations. Uh, very many of them are actually the auspos of banks and, and the manufacturers, but also security companies like Trail of Bits or Apio and a bunch of others. Um, yeah, and uh, the OpenSSF understands itself as an advocate for maintainers and administrators. And although paid by the industry, it is a forum of uh, actually technicians. Um, so yeah, um, my my talk was meant to take <laughs> the. So that wonderful, and this is like, I, I left out a bunch of things, but it is like, that is a EU sector regulation. And because if you start to look at how software is regulated, it's not just the, the regulations that I, that I uh, uh, mentioned. You have a lot more. You have the Interoperability Act. You have the Cybersecurity Act. You have NIST. They contain aspects where it is about you know, where you have to deal with software and software security. So the question is, if it's like specific to open source, and this is like where I realized I was wrong, there is not really a lot of stuff in the, in the, in the, in the regulation that targets specifically open source. There is actually no difference. It says like, you know, third party libraries or whatever. So at the end, the only regulation that really does that is the CRA and how it's going to be formed out of everything. It's an uh, act of sanitization, and that is going to start in the next couple of weeks with like the expert groups and, and the, the process at Sentinelec. So, um, yeah. However, um, so I, I changed that talk to, to uh, from that super high level uh, risk management that also contains like, you know, incidents response or other things to just focus on supply chain questions. That is also because the organization is focused on that subject. Um, yeah, like what, like so. What are threats to the supply chain in the open source space? When you have followed a little bit, like the news over the, like especially last week, um, but you know, like in fact, it actually goes on since March. You have an increased attack uh, against uh, open source uh, hosters. Um, that um, th they get attacked in a way that uh, confuses um, users and automation um, what version of a software to use and the or like of a of a library and while GitHub lab, uh, here GitHub is like able to to 
uh, delete a lot of the automated um, attempts to pollute the, 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 the code. There are still more than 100,000 that is clear that they, are not, they were not caught by the processes. So that means, and they are like you know, ongoing attacks and they are coordinated and, and you know, like that's the same group that does that since March. So you get an idea how polluted that space already is. And the question is here, what do you actually do with it? So how do you look at these type of problems and say, okay, how to secure against something that, I, that is very hard to look at and to understand what's actually going on there if you are not a security expert yourself? Um, let's look at what the, uh, the a typical supply chain looks like. Um, so you have like the, the, uh, the, the, the developer and the consumer, and in between you have like, uh, um, like the source, the build, and the, the packages, including the dependencies. So the, the threats that you have uh, when it comes to, to, the, to, like, uh, to, the, to the source and credit integrity um, are basically all changes that are there when you ha have a repository. Like either your, 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 your repository system is owned. It is like, that is a little bit the problem of, uh, of, of trusting trust the way, like, you know, when your build system is open source and that system is already, you know, like owned, you can never build anything secure. Um, and this is like where these two components, the, 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 the source, code repositories, source code repositories and the, 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 the build systems are actually the, the essential parts of, of what you have to look at. Um, and the, the, the way how you, how you look at it can't be fully automated. So you, you, like, when you want to assess the risk of a project that you want to use, you have to have something that is a manual review. Um, like even for me, like that happened that I used a, a, a library that was actually one of the, the, the Python libraries that got owned. And that for me was really like a, a, a very extreme morning sign. It even happens to me. It, is, it easily happens to everybody who is like doing that. And especially the way how the attacks that I was talking about, they also pollute that space of like, you know, stack exchange and others where people just copy and paste things. So there is, there, there, there is a real threat to the, the overall integrity of what open source is in the moment and how it's used and how it's like move forward from there. So one way of doing that to, to have at least automated checks, they still need to have a review is the OpenSSF scorecard. What that basically or the idea is basically that you either as an individual maintainer, as an organization or as a consumer, have the opportunity to look at some metrics that help you to understand the practices of a project. Um, I, I go into a little bit more detail later on, but it's like the idea of, so just looking at the GitHub repository does not necessarily help you to see and understand what's going on if you don't really know what you look at. And um, the scorecard is meant to deliver the type of metric that you can take and then, okay, this is like a, a, a good base to, to, to start to look at if that project is viable for what we are going to do uh, in terms of security and, and how, they, how they actually deal with, um, with what, yeah, what the typical issues are. So the scorecard actually uh, looks at five distinct uh, aspects uh, to understand, like, you know, or, or to help answer some questions that are needed to be answered in order to, yeah, like, to understand what, yeah, what the issues are and how, like, you know, how a project actually deals with it. So the, the first and probably, like, most obvious part is how a project deals with 
um, known vulnerabilities, so if the project fixes them, how they deal with PRs and, and um, this is of course like high ranked, so if a project does not respond to any, any security things, you should really um, keep your hands off it. The second uh, uh, group of questions uh, concerns uh, the maintenance. So it can, uh, includes the question, so do they automatically update uh, their, their, uh, their dependencies? Is there more than one maintainer? Um, and is there, is there uh, like, you know, are there defined processes for security um, and so on? And then uh, they are relatively, I believe, relatively hard answers. So it means like if you see there's only one maintainer, okay, like sometimes it's, it's okay if it's a small project. But um, if, you, if you have a larger project with only one person, that is a red flag. Um, and also, of course, like, you know, what, what, what do you have then to the processes? And then there is like uh, what the, the, the scorecard also, like th the idea is also for the, for the developer to have something where you can improve your own posture, that you have an idea what you can improve in order to also build trust for your consumers. And what is like the, the, the thing at the end, the, the CAI uh, best practice is like um, the, uh, used to be the core infrastructure initiative uh, perspectives patch, um, is now the OpenSSF perspectives practice patch that uh, allows um, to yeah, express that you follow all of the, the, the best practice, including like fully signed workflows and stuff like this. Um, the third part is, I cannot read that. Ah, continuous testing. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, when you have uh, personal tokens and you ask GitHub for um, for the, the 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 project, it also gives you back what uh, type of automation it actually has. Um, if it use like Travis or, or like Jenkins and or, or like Circle AI, that, they that is only ranked low risk because. Um, so there, there is a thing about how you need to test that thing anyways. These type of tests are something that you can add yourself because it is full automation. So they don't matter that much. It is more like in a, in a grand scheme of things when you say, okay, like I look at it and like they might not be focused on that specific aspect, but again, the idea is that people can improve. And this is one thing to improve, to say, okay, what is like a useful automation to look at the security of my, of my project? Because, you know, like it does not make sense to put like just security on something that doesn't make sense. Makes it, okay. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, the next uh, part is like the question about uh, the, uh, yeah, like the binary artifacts and, and stuff that are left, leftovers in repositories. So for example, if you have pick files or so, they are binaries that are leftovers in your, in your, uh, um, like in your repository and that might possess a risk because you can actually execute them. And um, it looks like these tests look at these type of things, like are there leftovers? Is there anything that you can't easily assess? Is there something where you need an extra like reverse engineering step or something like that? The other thing is like branch protection. That is a very important aspect of security when you host projects on things like G GitHub so that you, that, um, that you have a process that ensures that that the the the, um, the uh, that the upstream cannot just um, polluted by like anybody, uh, you know that that you have a very clear like model of who is allowed to push these type of things. Um, then um, workflows. It is like uh, like. Uh, so you cannot look at all the workflows as far as I understand that, but the, the, 
the ones that are the most interesting ones from that perspective is everything that does insecure, that does insecure or untrusted uh, checkouts. So when you have like something that that uh, doesn't have pin dependencies and you have an automation step where the the, the repository itself that you uh, uh, um, that you that you ask is not signed or anything, and and uh, um, you know it's a typical thing where the attack that I I expressed in the beginning hits very easily. Um, then yeah, like the PR checks. Uh, yeah, the number of code reviewers. That is also relatively soft because it can happen that you have something that is so small that people don't like that they don't have anybody. But it is as bigger the project gets, the more important it is how the code review actually goes down and that it has a code review before um, there there is um, anything um, pushed. Um, then. It's like I have to. Okay. <laughs> um, then the 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 last part is um, all of the hard questions for the for the the actual build. So it means like, uh, are they are there their their specific hashes? So like, do you pin the version of the software that you include? While that. Is a, a bit more effort if you if you do that, especially when you want to be in line with like you know uh, uh, vulnerability disclosure and, and 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 fixes. Still, for uh, a lot of projects, that is really it, it. It is the right way to do. It is probably even um, I believe more secure to keep it like this and then have a little bit of a gap between. Being able to update, rather than don't have signed and 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 pinned dependencies. So, just for the simple reason that when you don't have that, your attack surface is like big the whole time, and you only have that that little window when you pin dependencies and you need to have time to actually update your dependencies. That window is smaller, and so I believe it's preferred to having something that is not not pinned and 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 allows for this type of 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 attack. And then, last but not least, is like the question of does the project has uh, signed releases? So does it like? Can I be sure that the software comes from the person or group that I believe it comes from? Of course, it can also be like hacked or whatever, but it is a relatively small like or like smaller likelihood in the grand scheme of things. Uh, and it is like here also the question of assessment. So is that does the project does that, uh, or, and, and do we require that for what we do? And this is like again to to zoom out. If you do something commercially. You have a different way of you have like how you have to show things and how you ha have to comply with things, and this is a way how you can determine in advance what you can actually do. Um, so, oops, how how can the scorecard be used? So you can use it as a like as a uh, as an action. Um, you just you just put that into the into the. Uh, Code scanning tab and then edit. Um, as a as a user, you can you can uh, use the web viewer, which is like uh, a URL that contains like the repository, uh, like GitLab, uh, Git Git uh, uh, Hub GitLab support only uh, in the moment. Also, a REST API and uh, the uh, uh, command interface. Um, and what recently came, it is really nice, especially for, for the uh, use case that I mostly describe here, is um, the, the, uh, like a visualizer for the API. I can actually show that. That would be the easiest way of doing that. 
Um, that is just a, yeah, like a typical, a typical um, web application. Oh, I have no internet. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, I did not have enough time to actually check that beforehand. Sorry. <coughs> so, yeah, but it, but, it, but it looks like this, so you have like. Uh, the idea here is that you have like a score that uh, now before, and then you have like stuff that might change, and you have a list of what these changes are once they are applied to that project or to the to the thing, and you have the same as a as a list of because you don't look at one library, of course, and and and, and project you look at several, so that is like a way how you can look at it as a like you know uh, as a list. And uh, yeah, that's like basically the, the scorecard monitor. Yeah, that's a project that uh, uh, is is very open and and uh, f like really loves uh, you know, like you to contribute and to ask questions and to uh, demand things. Um, the other thing that I just wanted to to mention briefly that are other tools that help in that whole like uh, thing that is like uh, salsa that is um, a, a tool that helps uh, to to build more secure and also has uh, an improvement uh, or like improvement cycles built in so you have like basically four type of build levels, level zero is like nothing, that, uh, level one is provenance, and a provenance that shows how the packages are actually built. The second one is the same but signed, and L3 is like a hardened build platform. So it means like that you, that helps you with a set of tools and, 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 uh, um, and, Methodologies to improve your 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 security. Then six was like uh, like you know an easier way to sign and 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 uh, um, and uh, check uh, for signatures. Uh, then guac that that is something that I really love because I did the same at the Human Brain Project. That is basically a graph that gives you the opportunity to look at how. Uh, dependencies are uh, like you know impacting the overall security of your project. So it means like for example, you know you have like I don't know like a, a minor library somewhere uh, that is vulnerable, and it shows you how it actually presents a vulnerability in your infrastructure. And for me, like it's better, but it is still like I absolutely love it. Like it's my absolute favorite. Uh, like you know. Uh, uh, not toy in the moment. Then GitHub is like it. Um, GitHub ensures that you, when you s when you uh, get dependencies, that they are actually from the place that you expect them to be, uh, uh, to come from, and also to have uh, that all signed. Uh, five minutes. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, some 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 last like uh, notes here. It's uh, the. OpenSSF moved um, towards uh, making more events, and the, the 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 group of events that are going to come and also in Europe are <coughs> um, called ZOS Secure Open Source Software events, and they are because you see here like on one hand they're community focus, they're also like there's a maintainer. Uh, um, um, forum that that uh, works on on invite-only base, and then also policy submits. Um, the the one that is going to happen in Brussels is the 14th of May. And um, yeah, and there are a bunch of other things uh, to to come. 
uh, in the moment, uh, the, there's really a lot going on, and it's like the, the I, I hope to uh, be able and to do that a little bit better than I did now. But yeah, um, <laughs> that uh, concludes my, my talk. Yeah, if you have, if you have questions, um, yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot for I'm your talk. I'm actually nervous, like, sorry. <laughs> no worries. Do you have questions in the audience? Speechless. I also don't have questions on the web page. Okay. So, uh, I, so, so I have more time, yeah? You have more time. Just a couple of minutes, four minutes. Is there anything that's interesting beside that? We can go to the beginning again. Because what people, I believe, don't recognize, if you if you look at at the at the at this list, and again, it it leaves out uh, two thirds of the regulation. When you look at, let's say, for example, these type of things, the information security regulation, what would you think that it actually is? Do you think it has to do with with source code? Or let's take the Solidarity Act. What does it actually in, entitle in terms of, you know, like the things that you share? This is like, I, like when I got that list like from, from like uh, uh, Bruegel and then, you know, like look at the whole like kind of what's there, I, were, I realized I don't understand anything. And um, it takes, it will take a while uh, for a person like me, but also for like, yeah, I, I, I try to help the community as well. This is a, like, they throw all of the pieces on the table, and the next five years is going to see how they actually fit. And here you get an idea why it is so complicated, because there are so many aspects of it, and they all have, uh, you know, like, a connection to each other. So yeah, that's it. <laughs>